Are you building a high growth business in tech, healthcare, AI, media entertainment, or consumer goods and services? If so, we'd like to help you scale. Apply for a chance to win capital, coaching, and access to an amazing community of diverse innovators. Applications for the fourth annual Black Ambition Prize competition are now open. Don't miss your chance to win $1 million. Apply today at blackambitionprize.com. The day that Will Packer called me, I actually wrote down, I will be presented with an amazing opportunity today. So it was almost like I felt like I had a little bit of control over my life, even though I didn't. But I just woke up every day like, let me write intentions and try to be positive through this process. It's really interesting because I think oftentimes, as much as people say that they want to see that, I don't know if they really want to see it. How does somebody go from being unemployed and virtually homeless to becoming one of our best known celebrity bloggers with a budding media empire? Well, that's been the past of Nicole Kane, but you probably know her as Nicole Bitchy. Former blogger and entrepreneur, Nicole Kane. She's the founder of My Happy Flow, which is a period supplement brand. I just want to say last year was terrible. I got turmoil in two businesses at the same time. And I was just like, I can't. And so when I left XO, I was like, you have to run your, this company differently. Or like you said, you're gonna burn out. You have heard of Nicole Bitchy. Yes. Now Nicole Bitchy is leaving her wildly successful blog behind. I decided to do a YouTube video. It was called What I Wish I Knew Before I Left a Successful Brand. I just felt like I was failing. I think Essence sent out a newsletter and it said like, Nicole Bitchy from boss to broke. I'm seeing all the commentary. I'm going to cry. It was my worst fear to fail in front of everybody. And I felt like the world was seeing me fail. Welcome, Nicole, to the So Ambitious podcast. You are media mogul, right? A serial entrepreneur, celebrity blogger. What other hats are you wearing? Man, what other hats? Um... <laughs> I love that question. Super friend, mm -hmm. um, queen of career pivot. Hey. I like to call myself that. Pain free period goddess. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So queen of career pivot. Yeah. Let's start there. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, um, so hi guys, my name is Nicole Kane. Um, but I started my career as a, as people know me as a celebrity gossip blogger. Um, and I did that for seven years and it was incredible, of course, a lot of fun. Um, and then on my seventh year, I decided I wanted to do something more purposeful and intentional. And so I transitioned, uh, well, I shut down the site, but I call it a transition into exonicole.com, which is a women's lifestyle and empowerment platform. And two years into running that, um, I sold it to Will Packer Media, ran by Hollywood producer Will Packer. And I stayed on for five years. And then um, on that seventh year of running that site, I transitioned out and I started My Happy Flow, which is a women's hormones health brand centered around the menstrual and hormone health of women of color. Mm -hmm. To unpack the transition a little bit, right? And I love that you call it the queen of career pivots. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes people think that if they're pivoting from one thing that they, the brand that they've built, the only thing that they've known, that it's something negative and not mm -hmm. positive. And so talk to us a little bit about um, your first platform, right? Nicole Bishy, mm -hmm. um, which was a very public kind of, a public platform for sure in the storytelling and the way that which you did it and then also kind of like an equally public kind of I'm at the end of this because it no longer serves me yeah. I'm not serving people or my legacy in the way that I want talk to us just a little bit more about that journey oh my god well first of all I think I feel like I'm moving scared right now mm -hmm. like even being up here on this stage talking to you uh -huh. <laughs> I'm like scared of everything now, but back then I was so fearless. Mm. And so I feel like when you start something and you have nothing to lose, like I, I was already broke at the bottom. Um, you're just, you just move differently, mm. you know, before you have the kids, before you have the husband. And so, you know, I started uh, Nicole Bitchy with such a fearless 
uh, attitude. So when it was time for me to transition out seven years in, honestly, I wanted to do it three years in. Mm -hmm. I was over it by year three, but it was like, what are you going to do after this? And yeah. so many people are watching and it's mm -hmm. so hard to make a transition when you've already proved yourself successful. Yeah. And then you have an audience watching you. And so um, I, you know, put a letter up on my website the day I decided to like quit mm -hmm. as I, and you know, I'm explaining why I can no longer do this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, it was just such a, it was freeing, but I have never had so much paranoia, paranoia in my life because I knew people were watching like, what you gonna do next girl? Right. Um, and so I, I uh, like kind of rushed to start a new site, which was Exo Nicole. I put up Exo Nicole six weeks after closing down Nicole Bitchy. So I had no time to rest, no time to heal or like just- Or process why process, you, yeah. Like sit back, take a leap year or something. <laughs> I just jumped into the next thing because I was scared to lose my audience. Mm. And so I was like, well, if I turn the switch, maybe they'll stay. Um, but sometimes when you're like evolving, it's not, it's, it doesn't mean everybody's going to evolve with you. Right. So some people weren't in the mindset to change from getting their celebrity news to now you guys are doing more lifestyle and mental health and talking about sex and yeah. all these things. And so it was, it was difficult. Yeah. There's a, there's a purging process that happens, yeah, right? Absolutely. So from a personal <laughs> standpoint, and then also those that follow you. Right. And so. Talk a little bit more about that. But I just felt like people were like, yeah, girl, you, you, you're going to be back. Uh -huh. And so uh, something happened that I felt was very humiliating mm -hmm. to me. And I sometimes tear up when I talk about it. I hope I don't now. But mm -hmm. like a year into it, I, um, I, I'm always transparent. I'm always blogging and that type of thing. I, I think I watched a YouTube video you were talking about. Who were you before you were interrupted. Mm -hmm. This is my interrupted moment. Okay. I decided to do a YouTube video and say, hey, like it was called what I wish I knew before I left a successful brand. Mm. And I was just talking about how I was running out of money. Like this, this brand was costing me so much more to run. Um, and like all the plans I had was like, I just felt like I was failing basically. Mm. And I put out this YouTube video and I might have went on a vacation or I don't know what happened, but while I'm on vacation, this this video goes viral mm -hmm. and it's on everybody's website. I'm trending on Twitter and like I think Essence sent out a newsletter and it said like um, Nicole Bitchy from boss to broke. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, you know, like I'm seeing all the commentary and that was my moment. I'm going to cry. I don't cry. Take a deep breath. It's crazy that I still cry yeah. because I felt the world, um, it was my worst fear to mm -hmm. fail in front of everybody. Yeah. And I felt like the world was seeing me fail. And not only that, but I felt like people were cheering the failure mm. because they were so mad that I took something away that was a part of their everyday life. Mm -hmm. Like they enjoyed coming to the website every yeah. day, multiple times a day and getting their news. So it's like, how dare you take this thing away from me? Mm -hmm. That is a part of my culture, I guess. It was a mm -hmm. cultural thing. And so I felt the world was parading the failure. Mm. And that's what uh, gets me crying every time I talk yeah. about it. Take a deep breath. Because your story and your journey and as transparent as you've been have helped so many, right? Yeah. Um, do you feel looking back that it actually was failure or it's just the ebb and flow of running a business? Well, you know, a year later, um, the news came out that Will Packer had bought my mm -hmm. website, mm -hmm. you know? And I just feel like if if they didn't see the low moment, then it would look, would have looked like I'm always winning. Mm -hmm. Like she goes straight from one thing, oh, now this Hollywood producer has come along and bought her site. Yeah. It's easy for her. So looking back, I felt 
it was necessary to show a moment of, yes, you go through transitions. No, it won't be easy. Yeah. Like it's, it's literally, I think I heard Lauren Hill talk about um, how we always want to climb a mountain and stay at the top of the mountain. But like you can't get to the top of the next mountain without coming down off of one. And right. so it like valleys and peaks. And I, and so now I look back and say it was meant for me to do that publicly. Mm -hmm. And like I always say, you know, when you ask God to use you, you can't choose how he uses right. you. He had to show that moment, which was a moment of humi humiliation for me. But he was like, I have a win coming mm -hmm. the next year. But they need to see this first. Yeah, yeah. And and there was a process that sounded like you needed to go through too, right? Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, I think, you know, talk to Brian Rakeem with Lightship Capital earlier, who also had like a very public moment in the company that that he built. And it, it's it's really interesting because I think oftentimes, as much as people say that they want to see that, I don't know if they really want to see it. <laughs> Right. Or at least experience, experience mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Like we I remember we, my husband and I, when we closed our store in Miami, that was a very public like closing. And we held on to like the pain and suffering with our investors, some partly because it was going to be something very public when we had to close our physical store. But then talking with elders, they're just like, no, you need to get past that as soon as possible. But like there's a mental multiple mental hurdles that I think you have to go through when you're doing something for the first time, right? Absolutely. Or when it's as big as what you build and you have the people that are cheering you on, but then you definitely have the people that are cannot wait for the downfall and they're, and they're louder than mm, that. So much louder. So much louder. <laughs> and so is there any other advice just kind of in that process, right? When you had to make some very serious decisions and of course there were going to be the naysayers, but like, what is the thing that you said to yourself or who did you surround yourself with to just kind of help you weather that weather that storm um, and kind of silence the criticism as much as you possibly could? Not really, but I was living in, I had moved to Arizona before to go through the transition mm -hmm. because I felt like living in LA or New York, I was going to be around people who had an idea of who they were going to hold me to this mm -hmm. idea they have of me. And I was changing. Mm -hmm. I was evolving. Um, but no, I, I started writing intentions every day. Mm -hmm. Like right now, what was going to happen to me? Mm -hmm. I swear, like every day I would be like the, the day that uh, Will Packer called me, I actually wrote down, I will be presented with an amazing opportunity mm -hmm. today. So it was almost like I was, I, I felt like I had a little bit of control over my life, even though I didn't, but I just woke up every day, like, let me write intentions. And try to be positive through this process yeah. because I didn't know how I was going to make my next check. I was, you know, so I didn't know. And this is after having so much success. Um, and during that time I'm selling my, I sold my car, you know, um, I sold everything in my apartment. I moved to New York with one suitcase I, mm. um, of clothes and I rented a $600 apartment. And this is after like the success of right, seven years right. of, but I had poured so much of my own money into this new brand that wasn't making any money, paying all the writers out of pocket that I just started running out of money and didn't know what to do. But I knew I wanted to save my brand mm -hmm. and I was willing to do whatever it took. I do know while I was in that $600 a month, like, you know, apartment living with the rotating roommates, I was just like, please don't let nobody see, see me. Please don't let anyone oh. see me coming out of this place. So it was just a very humbling moment in my life. Yeah, yeah. Um, talk to us a little bit more about the the question of what's next, right? Because I think that's also a part of this process where you may not have an answer for what's next, right? Or like you said, it kind of forced you to jump into a next before you were you were ready. And I think uh, I think I heard Sherelle talk about that on one of her episodes as well like this pressure around answering the question like what's next and not having an answer and also being okay with that like tell me just a little bit about that process for you I think for me if I knew I was naive about what it would take to run a media company and in, in the way I wanted to run it mm -hmm. if I knew and had did the research and really like 
did all the preparation, I would have never did it. Mm -hmm. So maybe sometimes you have to like go into things with very naive, like, I don't know what's going on, but mm -hmm. I'm gonna figure it out when I get there. I'm gonna jump off the, the ledge and hope the parachute open. Um, so yeah, that was what, and even, you know, running uh, Exo Nicole for six years, knowing I was coming on for my seventh year, and not knowing what was next for me. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of depression there because it was like, what are you, like, you've already sold this site, you signed a non-compete, you can't me work it in media or have a similar site ever again. What are you gonna do when you leave Exo Nicole? Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's how I got into women's wellness and health, but yes, that what's next is scary. Mm -hmm. Especially again, I keep saying this because I'm a, I'm a single woman and so I can move, I feel a little bit more freely. Mm -hmm. But when you have like kids that are reliant on you and the check that you're bringing home, you know, your partner, mm -hmm. like that's a harder decision. Maybe even parents you're taking care of. Yeah. So you sold the company to Will mm -hmm. Packers. Mm -hmm. um, what was that process of much you can share, right? Mm -hmm. Like the decision even though there was some ebb and flows going on for you, but the decision to sell your thing and see it exist without you. Well, first of all, Will came to me, offered me a job opportunity. And it sounded like he wanted me to be like an editor in chief of a website similar to Exo Nicole. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I was like, wait, is this going to compete with Exo Nicole? Like, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. And second, I wasn't doing well with Exo Nicole, so I'm not going to go mess up your money. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure this out yeah. over here. So I told him I wasn't interested and I knew five people I could recommend him, but every month he would come back, he would call once a month, every month. Mm -hmm. And finally, I just wanted to know what the opportunity entailed. And then the conversation switched over to them buying my website. Now I had never, I didn't even know what an acquisition was. Mm -hmm. I had only knew one person that had ever sold a company and it was Lisa Price mm -hmm. that looked like me, like a black woman. Mm -hmm. And she got so much backlash mm -hmm. because she sold to L'Oreal, a white company. So I didn't know anything about what that entailed, what that would mean for me, what that would mean for my website. I knew I wasn't going to get as much backlash because he was a black man and a lot of things he do, uh, his films are, his audiences are black women. So it made sense. But yeah, um, that's how the conversations kind of progressed. And there was a, that summer I said I moved to New York and sold everything. It was the summer I was going through negotiations, but I knew I had to have a plan B in case it fell through. Mm -hmm. Then in my mind, he's coming out with a site, another site, he's gonna find someone else right. to run this site and it's gonna compete with mine and I'm not going out like that. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> So just in case, I'm about to humble myself, sell everything, move to New York, and we're going to figure out how to make this successful with or without Will Packer. Mm -hmm. So you stayed on for five years? After, after I sold the site, which is most people only stay on for a year or two. Mm -hmm. My original contract in negotiations was for two years, and I asked for three because I just feel like the first year, an acquisition is like, getting married to somebody you never dated like it's a for shot, real. like a shotgun marriage <laughs> like you never dated them y'all haven't courted you don't know like what their likes and dislikes you don't know conflict resolution style uh, none of it <laughs> and so yeah um that first year i was like okay what's supposed to happen um but yeah <laughs> how does it feel to see your baby exist without you um, it's hard. It's like, like, like you said, calling it a baby. It's like you birthed the baby, you birthed the child, you raised it for a little bit and then you handed it over to someone and they're raising your child and you're hope you hoping your child doesn't come back home and talk back to you. Mm -hmm. And they still have the same values. They still, um, have the same morals and, and, and the vision that you have. So, um, uh, I don't follow Exo Nicole across anything cause it just was so, it was hard, mm -hmm. like for me, but I do. Again, uh, Will is such an amazing man. Like I, I used to get on a bus. Like if I was to go to a set of one of his movies, everyone that mentioned him has such great things to say about him. Mm -hmm. I had never met a person that, and I think 
I could have went through many acquisitions, but I feel like they did the best they could to make me feel comfortable in this acquisition. Mm -hmm. And and so, yeah, I'm I'm still happy with my decision because honestly, if I never, if they never bought my site, it wouldn't be up today. So, <laughs> oh, and that's just the truth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I, I, I understand that on a deep level because people ask me that about, we sold Black Tech Week, our conference, and I found out with my husband two years ago. Uh, and people were just like, how do you feel? I was like, I feel fine. <laughs> like, <laughs> I feel great. Yeah. Like, I don't feel FOMO. I don't feel, and, and that's how you know it's time. Yeah, right? absolutely. Um, and then to be able to see something exist without you. And live on. it's hard. Yeah. But there's no... There's no feeling that like I, I want to if they ask me to come yeah. back, I would come like absolutely, absolutely not. Like it lives on beautifully. Yeah. And there's there's a legacy, which is what you mentioned Lisa Price. That's what she talked about. She's like, yeah. I sold my company to one of the biggest beauty brands in the world and people felt some kind of way. And she was just like, that was success for her was to sell. And so success looks like looks differently to everybody of why they started it and what the ending was supposed to look like. Absolutely. I mean, your ego might be like wanting to feel needed, mm -hmm. right? Like it's, it's a site out there with my name on it Yeah. <laughs> that I'm no longer a part of. Right. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad that I was able to build something that can live beyond me. And I hope to continue to build companies that can live beyond me. That's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us, okay. So from, queen of career pivots, right? <laughs> We're talking about like now like the third or fourth pivot. Tell us between that last one to now my happy flow. How that all came mm -hmm. about. So my happy flow, it's funny because when Will came trying to buy my site, I was studying holistic nutrition and I wanted to help women with their health back then. No. So I got a little rerouted, but a, a, a great reroute. Um, with my happy flow, that, that, Good child. So my happy flow, it stems from my parents died very young. They were 41 and 42 when they passed away. I have no living grandparents. And so what ran in my family was heart attacks, strokes, every health condition um, out there. And they'd go through surgeries. They'd go through, um, be on a bunch of medications, more surgery, more medications. And it would always end up in death. And I was like, there has to be a better way. And so I think I was around 35 when um, my period went missing. Mm -hmm. And and I'll tell you why the, that's important later on, because people are like, well, your period went missing. But that was an indication that something was going on with my health. Yeah. Um, and so went to a holistic doctor. They nursed me back to health through a vitamin blend. And that was the first time, like I, I said, my family has always been on medications. I, she gives me a custom blend of vitamins and I feel amazing. My period returns, all the things. So I got very interested in how we can heal through whole foods and vitamins, how we can change our lifestyle. And so I study holistic nutrition. I study hormones. And that's how I ultimately came up with the ingredients in my happy flow. I found out that, um, first of all, your period is your fifth vital sign. So like when you go to the um, doctor and they take your blood pressure or your heart rate, like your period is just as important. That's why they ask you, well, when was the last the time last you came one, on your yeah. period? Um, because if it's a regular, if it's painful, if it's heavy, if it's prolonged, it's a sign that you have hormonal imbalances. Mm -hmm. And if those hormonal imbalances aren't addressed, they turn into conditions like fibroids. Right. And you know, like they say 50% of African-American women will have fibroids before the age of 50. Mm -hmm. So to me, it was very important to launch My Happy Flow, not just because it's an all-natural product that helps women have pain-free, symptom-free periods through balancing their hormones, but also we're reducing risk of fibroid tumors. Right. We're reducing risk of breast cancer, PCOS, endometriosis, and all these different estrogen-dependent mm -hmm. conditions. So I, the, the holistic health benefit is going to help so many, has helped so many, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is, there a, is there another deeper why to why this is what you're working on right now? Um, I just, honestly, every brand I've curated has been for black 
women, um, of course, all women, we have all customers, but I formulated this blend with black women, especially black women that have fibroids in mind because they are vitamin D deficient. They do have anemia, you know, iron deficiency. Um, but the deeper part was every friend around me in my late 30s was getting diagnosed with fibroids. Mm -hmm. I'm the only one out of my friend group, and there's so many of us that has not been diagnosed with fibroids. And when I took a deeper look at it, and a few of them had hysterectomies, and they weren't given any other option. It's like, I want to take your uterus, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, this doesn't make, like, is this a attack on black women? Like, what's going on? Like, why is this our only option? Um, and one thing I noticed out of everyone that was getting diagnosed was birth control. Mm. And when, when you look at birth control, I know you, uh, we sometimes talk about products and the hormones or xenoestrogens or you, you know, clean beauty is very big right now because people are getting educated about all the chemicals that are in our products that are causing hormonal imbalances and all these other health conditions. Well, there's synthetic hormones in birth control. And so, yeah, a and, lot. So, and so I realized the hormones in birth control was accelerating fibroid growth, you know, or um, putting people at risk of post pill PCOS and all these other things. And I'm like, wait, but that's what the doctors give you when you have fibroids. They normally like I recommend birth control or when you're a teen and you go to the doctor and you have uh, period pain or hormonal acne, sometimes they don't even test you for anything. They just say, hey, this birth control will, um, it will regulate your period when it really doesn't. So this, it's, this brand to me is more about educating women on their bodies and their hormone health because we can like when a woman heals herself, she heals her daughter, mm -hmm. she heals her, heals her granddaughter, she heals the woman around her. Mm -hmm. So now when I see uh, mothers and they come to me and they say, my 13 year old daughter is on my happy flow. I'm like 20 years ago, she would have been on birth control. Right. And then 20 years later, she would have been dealing with fibroids and fertility, all these different reprodu reproductive health conditions. Mm -hmm. What have you taken from your first two brands that you incorporate into this? I think just community, like listening to my audience and learning the pain points of women who look like me. Um, you know, when I was Nicole Bitchy, I'm in the comment section and I could tell there was women that I was giving them junk food, but they wanted the vitamin. Mm. And so that's what made me transition over to Excel Nicole, which was more um, more empowering content. And then we have Excel Nicole, and uh, all these you know different writers are writing about their periods and fibroids and PCOS and all these And I'm like, wow, um, we we feel so empowered when it comes to our finances and elevating in our career because it was during a time like all the girl bosses was coming up but we feel disempowered when it comes to our health. Yeah. And there's so many women that are suffering in silence with different, you know, you can go in a, I'm in a room now full of women. And, and I know there are women that are dealing with fibroids or some type of reproductive health condition um, because that's how the stats are yeah. set up. So I think for me, it's been always seeing a void, seeing a need and how can I feel it? Do you feel with, with, with this company that you have set a new tone, set a new expectation on how we should be caring for black women? Or you feel like you're still trying to disrupt it? I, I need to be a little bit more visible in this season. Like this is a season I've taken a year off from speaking again. This is like probably one of my first speaking engagements in however long mm -hmm. because just, you know, sports team, they have off seasons yeah. where they can heal their bodies and all that other stuff. So I think from me losing my parents and all this trauma and grief, I was over medicating. I was overworking as a form of Medicaid. Yeah. Like I wasn't taking the time to really heal from those traumas. Um, I think a lot of things I've learned about hormone health, especially when what I just told you about birth control, 
if that's all we've known for so long, like mm-hmm. trying to get people to unlearn that, the amount of feedback that's going to come my way as I start talking more about that, um, especially in a Roe versus Wade mm-hmm. society. Now I have to talk about, well, they'll say, well, what's the alternative? Now I have to teach women how to fertility awareness and how to track their cycles and how to know when they're ovulating and mm-hmm. how to look at their cervical mucus uh-huh. <laughs> and know when they're fertile, you know, but it, it feels like a lot and mm-hmm. it feels heavy, you know, um, but sometimes your purpose has to be way greater than your comfort zone. Mm. And so I'm just preparing myself for like God gave you this call and you have to answer the call. You have to go out there and you have to be more vocal and visible and teach the people. Yeah. How are you putting your armor on to get ready to do that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of journaling and um, just I think that's why I needed this season away from the speaking engagements, away from the podcast to just get my mind right. Yeah. Um, because if not, I'm ready, but I wasn't ready a year ago. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Do you, when you need to take a break like that, right? Or you've launched a company where y- your name likeness mm-hmm. is still is still that, right? People want to see that, but you also say, you know what? In order to do that in the future, I got to take this break now can you just unpack a little bit of like how how you do that because i think a lot of entrepreneurs but specifically a lot of female entrepreneurs that are the face of their brand struggle with that and then it leads to burnout which i've i've been through oh, burnout yeah. twice so i know what that's <laughs> like i don't wish it on my worst enemy oh, right my um, but can you just talk to like were there certain systems you've put in place were there certain strategies you had to think through or you just like felicia like i just went cold turkey i just gotta like leave because there's a balance to that right and you got to figure some parts out of that otherwise the thing can potentially fall fall apart can you just share a little bit more insight on that well i just want to say last year was terrible Mm -hmm. because i was you know coming out of uh exo nicole Mm -hmm. and there were some things going on that just i couldn't wrap my head around but i was also going through something personally with my happy flow Mm kind of like a almost like a legal issue, but not because I had started the company with a friend and we didn't work out. So I got turmoil in two businesses at the same time. And I was just like, I can't. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so when I left XO in September of last year, I was like, you're going to have to, originally I was trying to run my happy flow like a media company. So I was about to be right back on that hamster Mm -hmm. wheel, doing all these workshops, doing all these events. And I was like, you have to run this company differently. Mm -hmm. Or like you said, you're going to burn out. Mm -hmm. And so I took a step back to put processes in place. I switched manufacturers so that our supply chain, like the amount of of time between production got very shorter. Um, I put a fulfillment center in place. Mm -hmm. They ship out the product for me. So all I have to worry about is marketing. And we put all these email flows in place. So as long as I get the customer to the website or if I collect, like your customer is rented until you get their their text message or their email. Mm -hmm. Now they can be your customer. But other than that, you're renting it from social media or any site that has gotten them to come over. So for me, I had to get that funnel together. And then now all I have to do is get people in the funnel, which I can do through ads. Um, that was a big fail, but that's a whole other story (laughs) in my season of not wanting to be visible. I wanted to try ads that did not work out for me. Oh, listen, that's a testimony of quite a few people. (laughs) I put a lot of money in paying an advertising agency and the, I'm like these little two sales, I could put up an Insta story. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like I just paid you 15 K and now, and I'm getting two sales a day. Facebook I'm, ads I'm is a back, trap, man. <laughs> I'm, so I'm, going back to, I'm going back to hustling on social media because uh-huh. like, <laughs> this isn't worth it. So, yeah, so I put all the things in place um, so that I could take that break and kind of just take the time to, like, just center, recenter mm-hmm. myself. And also, I will tell you one thing that changed my life is I got a, it, it was called a soul coach. I did soul coaching. Mm-hmm. But what she did was help me 
figure out my soul's desires. And she helped me figure out what, what's the end goal? Where do I want to end up? What do I want my family life to do? I want to be married? Do I want to have kids? Mm -hmm. What do my days look like mm -hmm. when I'm waking up in the morning? And that literally dictated how I was going to grow my company. Right. I realized I'm probably going to have to hire a CEO. I don't want to be the CEO because I envision mornings with my kids, mm -hmm. you know, um, pouring into myself. I envision, you know, going to soccer practices and that type of thing. And so when you know what you're working towards, it's easier to make the decisions to get you there. I would have tried to raise money really quickly if I didn't go through that soul coaching. Mm. But now I'm like, okay, in the moment I raise money, I'm back in a situation where I have bosses and right, people right. to answer to again. So how long can I bootstrap this so that I can live my life a certain way and run my business a certain way with a certain freedom? Nice. I love that. Soul coaching. Yeah, it was called soul coaching. <laughs> I love it. No, I, I mean, yeah. so many of the things you said around setting the intention, mm -hmm. like the flow of how you want the day to be, knowing that if you decide to go this route, which might be easier, right, getting the capital to give you the runway, but it's going to come with two things that oh are non-negotiables for you. And so that's really helpful. Last question. Any last, and I feel like soul coaching might have been it, but like any <laughs> last um, advice that you want to share around women that are getting ready to go on their wellness journey in whatever way it means for them, anything that you want to share from your, your journey that you think would be helpful for them guiding theirs? First, I want to, I want to go back to your last question real quick and just say, when my first two businesses, I just felt like how you getting in an Uber and telling them you want to go to California, but I never told them the address in California I want to get to. So I don't know where I'm going to end up. That's what I felt like with my first two businesses, mm -hmm. because I didn't really have a game plan of what's the exit strategy? Yeah. Where am I trying to end up at? And so I just felt like I was on autopilot to a destination I never chose. Mm -hmm. Like when I started My Happy Flow, it's like, okay, if you want to get this in the hands of as many women as possible, what is that going to mean? What mm -hmm. type of money do you have to raise? And if you raise money, we don't talk about this a lot. When you raise money, you're planning for an exit. Yeah. How are they going to get their money back? And so there's all this uproar, in a, in, in, especially in the Black community, about when someone sells. But you're, you were cheering when they raised $25 million. <laughs> but don't understand the flip side of that exactly yeah. but their investors has to get the money back so if you see someone raising money just know that they have plans to either sell their company or go public one day but how many women i only know one woman that went public and that was uh kathy huge mm -hmm. a black woman yeah kathy huge from the radio one and yeah exactly um so going back to your last question i just had to say that real quick <laughs> okay so my last last question because yeah, i feel like i have one. to ask you this yeah. Um, I mean, who is Nicole Kane uninterrupted? Um, you know what? She's, she's still trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. She would, I, you know, during this year off, I was uninterrupted because I was able to enjoy my friends. I was able to date for the first time. Like I'm running these business for years and not even allowing my myself the opportunity to connect mm -hmm. and, and find a potential partner. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, you know, she's, I want the uninterrupted Nicole. I'm, I'm working toward, look, it's October, it's scary season, but when I say scary season, it means doing the things that scare you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to see me on more stages like this. Mm -hmm. I want to see myself showing up on social media and sharing my truth. Um, that's who I am uninterrupted. Nice. So right now I'm kind of interrupted because I'm still kind of like- <laughs> Figuring it out. I don't know. Because yeah. here's my thing. If it costs you your piece, it's too expensive. Right. But if you're putting any information out that's going to change someone's life or change the way they think, you're going to get the um, feedback mm -hmm. loop. You know, and that's not peaceful, but it is what it is. It's unfortunate. <laughs> Fortunate sometimes an unfortunate part of that yeah. process. So. yeah. Putting yourself out there. Especially when you go viral. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Nicole, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> tell uh, tell the audience where they can find you online and where they can continue to follow you on your journey. Uh, 
Everyone can find me at Hello Nicole, H E L L O N E C O L E, across all platforms. You can find My Happy Flow at myhappyflow.co. And that's flow, like when we used to be like Aunt Flo mm -hmm. is in town, F L O. Uh, <laughs> and that's across all platforms as well. Nice. Thank you so much. Please give her a round of applause. Heineken is proud to support Black Ambition and helping to unlock opportunities for its participating founders. 